Reductive amination allows you to turn an aldehyde or a ketone into an amine. And it allows you to do that by doing a reduction. Now, the reduction should make sense. Remember that reduction means you're decreasing the number of bonds to an electronegative atom. In an aldehyde or a ketone, you have two bonds to an electronegative atom. And in an amine, you only have one. So there's sort of two things we have to accomplish in a reductive amination. The first is to replace the oxygen with a nitrogen, and then the second is to re reduce those two bonds to that electronegative element to just one. So that overall, conceptually, what we're going to do is turn a ketone into an imine. Now we've seen this before, we've drawn the mechanism for this before in the aldehyde and ketone chapter. You'll remember that all the steps in that mechanism, which was on a previous test, all the steps were reversible. And so even when you form this imine, there's still some ketone left. These exist at equilibrium. And then we can take this imine that now has the nitrogen on there, and you can reduce the number of bonds to the electronegative element with a reducing agent, and that will give you your amine. Now you might remember that the, the reagents that you need in order to turn a ketone or an aldehyde into an imine are first an, ami uh, an amine, so you have to have some sort of an amine here, that's going to be your nitrogen source. Here I'm going to choose the simplest amine, ammonia, the nitrogen version of water. So that's going to be where our nitrogen will come from. You also need, if you remember the mechanism, an acid catalyst. And those two things together will allow you to create an imine. So ammonia and an, and an acid catalyst. Now, if we wanted a different thing here than hydrogen, we could have put that onto our original nitrogen. So it doesn't have to be ammonia every time. I'm just using that here as an example because it's the simplest nitrogen compound. Once you have the amine, you can reduce it. So if you notice, here this nitrogen is only bonded to one hydrogen, and here it's bonded to two. This carbon is not bonded to any hydrogens. But here there's an invisible bond to a hydrogen. Only three bonds are drawn in. That means the fourth bond there is an implied bond to a hydrogen. So we've added a hydrogen both to the nitrogen and to the carbon in order to get this compound. One way you could do that is by bubbling hydrogen gas through the solution in the presence of platinum, palladium, or nickel. So for example, you could have a palladium metal catalyst there to turn the imine into an amine. That would work. You could have this whole slurry all happening at once. Pour your ketone into a beaker, pour some ammonia in there, and a little bit of acid catalyst, and then bubble hydrogen gas through and sprinkle some palladium metal. And little by little, the ketone that you had will turn into an amine. The hydrogen is sometimes kind of a pain to work with, though. First of all, it's a gas, so it's hard to contain. And second of all, it's flammable, so it lights on fire really easily, and then that, of course, could light everything on fire and destroy everything. So it's kind of a pain to work with, and it's a little bit more convenient to use a different reducing agent. And notice here, this hydrogen gas really is a reducing agent. It's reducing the number of bonds you have to an electronegative element by replacing those with bonds to hydrogens. So we could use another reducing agent to make that happen, one that is not a gas, one that's easier contain, to contain and that's not as flammable. The one that's most often used is a derivative of one that we've seen before, sodium borohydride. You might remember this as far back as being the second step in oxymercuration demercuration, that Markovnikov addition of H and OH that you learned in Organic Chemistry 1. Sodium borohydride is a reducing agent because it allows hydrogens to act as nucleophiles. Notice boron is a metal, so it has very low electronegativity. It gives its electrons away to whatever it's bonded to and becomes slightly positive. All the hydrogens here steal those electrons and become slightly negative. You don't usually think of hydrogen as a nucleophile, but if you bond it to a metal, then it becomes a nucleophile. The reason why we can't just use sodium borohydride by itself, which we're used to and which we're comfortable with, is because this 
hydrogen nucleophile is a strong enough hydrogen nucleophile to attack not just the imine, to turn it into an amine, but to attack the ketone, and it would turn it into an alcohol. So that would create a mess out of our products, and we don't want that. So instead, what we're going to do is to weaken these hydrogen nucleophiles here. And the way we can do it is by leaving almost the entire molecule intact, but replacing one of the hydrogens with an electron withdrawing group. Now, there are lots of electron withdrawing groups you could use, and each of them would have a similar effect as this. But just in terms of craftsmanship, people going into a laboratory and testing things and seeing what works, a good electron withdrawing group is a cyano group, a CN. That pulls electron density toward itself, this electronegative nitrogen here. And so it doesn't just pull electron density from the boron, but even across other atoms. So the electron density that was on the hydrogens ends up going to the nitrogen here. And the charge on the hydrogens becomes smaller because the electron density that was creating that charge is moving onto the nitrogen. Oops. So the nitrogen then becomes more negative. And so you could see that this turns these hydrogens into weaker nucleophiles. They don't have as strong of a negative charge. This, by the way, is called sodium cyanoborohydride. So you'd have, oops, you'd have the sodium still. It's balancing the charge of this whole big ion. You still have the boron. You still have three hydrogens, but the fourth one is replaced by a cyano group, a nitrile. And so we have sodium cyanoborohydride. Sodium cyanoborohydride. So sodium cyanoborohydride is still a reducing agent, it's just really, it's much weaker. And what you might remember is that in this process, as a ketone turns into an imine, there is a point at which, before the last proton transfer, there is a point at which the nitrogen has an extra hydrogen and a full positive charge. And actually, let me put that in blue a full positive charge, and this was called an iminium ion. This nitrogen is very electronegative. It's bonded twice to this carbon, and it's pulling electron density away from the carbon, not just through its electronegativity, but also through this positive charge, which is really attracting electrons. So this carbon becomes really slightly positive, and even a weak nucleophile will attack it. Even a weak nucleophile, like the hydrogens on sodium cyanoborohydride. So, sodium cyanoborohydride, the hydrogens on it are such weak nucleophiles that they will not attack ketones, oops, but they will attack the carbon on this iminium ion that's formed as the ketone is turned into the imine. And so, sodium cyanoborohydride selectively reduces the imine to an amine without affecting the ketone at all. So you'll see the sodium cyanoborohydride mixed in. So a really common recipe for turning a ketone or an aldehyde into an, into an amine, a really common recipe for doing reductive amination is to have some sort of an, some sort of an amine. Here I'll just use ammonia, but it could have a carbon chain on it. In the presence of an acid catalyst that creates the imine, and a reducing agent, really the most convenient one, is sodium cyanoborohydride, NaBH3CN. This is a solid reducing agent, so it's easy to contain, and it's not going to light on fire. So it's much more convenient than just bubbling hydrogen gas through in the presence of platinum, palladium, or nickel. So the big idea with these reductive aminations is that you're taking an aldehyde or a ketone, you're turning it into an imine by adding an amine, and an acid catalyst, and then you're reducing that imine to an amine, preferably by using sodium cyanoborohydride. And so it's this progression here. So that ultimately you're able to turn the aldehyde or ketone into an amine. Okay, so I'm gonna leave uh, this video for just a background concepts video. And in the next video, we are going to work our way through some exercises that apply 
this recipe to specific amines that we want.